Okay, so today we're going to talk about confirmation. The next, um, well, I shouldn't say necessarily the next in terms of what kids get, but uh, one of the prime sacraments of initiation. Um, and, and, you know, early on, kids would get it all. And, of course, adults would get baptized and get confirmed early in the church. Um, but we see uh, in the Old Testament some references to the Spirit. Even in the Old Testament, if you look, there are many statements in terms of the Spirit of God. And um, in, in the Old Testament, the term was ruah, and uh, was depicted as breath, air, or wind frequently. We see that in the creation story, as I mentioned. Um, in terms of separating the water from the land. Um, and it, Ruah shows God's intervention in history, in creation. And you see it again in terms of stories of certain men and people that the Spirit was with in the Old Testament. Um, so we see the hint of the Spirit very early on. In the New Testament, we see that the Spirit, <clears throat> because of Christ, is coming for everybody. Um, that with the Messiah, the Spirit is available to everyone, not just the chosen people. And of course, we see that in beginning in Easter and the fulfillment of it in a very dramatic way at Pentecost. When the apostles are filled with the Spirit and the mighty works of God begin. And we see lots of people in terms of being able to, one of the impacts of the Spirit is that the apostles preach in power so that thousands convert to the church and get baptized. And in Acts, what we see is when the, when the time for Pentecost was fulfilled. And remember, I mean, they obviously know Jesus. They've, uh, they've been baptized in, the, in Jesus, but something more is supposed to happen. Now, certainly it's supposed to happen to them because they're apostles in particular. But we see that, that in terms of our joining in that, um, where there is this process of confirming our faith. That's why we use the word confirmation later on, um, that the Spirit is doing something more. It's the Spirit, not us. So they were all in one place and suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a driving wind. So you see here in the New Testament the same ideas consistent with the Old Testament in terms of God's power in the wind. Because we know the wind can be very powerful, right? Can be damaging. Um, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues. How many of you have heard of the baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit? Heard that term. It's a term, and it's really an unfortunate term. It's, it's been used in the charismatic renewal, but it really, in a way, it's a heresy. And, but the people who are saying it don't in, in mean it that way. Because you get the Spirit when you're baptized. So why are people talking about that? Well, the people involved in the charismatic renewal, they're talking about really a different kind of experience with the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit operating in their lives in a more powerful way. So probably better to use a term like fullness of the Spirit rather than being baptized in the Spirit. But I just throw that out there because it's a term you'll hear and, and it could be confusing. From that time on, the apostles in fulfillment of Christ's will imparted to the newly baptized by the laying on of hands. 
the gift of the Spirit, that completes the grace of baptism. That's what the Catechism says. And you see early on, they anoint, very early in the church is the anointing with oil that we do at baptism, and then it'll be done for those who, you know, at confirmation also, is the oil. Because the oil tends to represent the Holy Spirit in many ways, in, in a symbolic way. And, and being a Christian, well, what do we, we say? Christening, right? That's what it means, is being anointed. And so, anointed with the oil. Now, in the Eastern Church, they call it chrismation, rather than confirmation. And there are several differences, and I don't want to get into all those differences. If you want to see those, you can see them in the Catechism, in the section on the sacrament. Um, but we want to focus, because we're going to be doing this in the Latin rite, so we want to see how we do it in the Latin rite. Um, I may mention a few things about it, though. In Acts 8, we see, but once they began to believe Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, men and women alike were baptized. Even Simon himself believed and after being baptized became devoted to Philip. And when he saw the signs and mighty deeds that were occurring, he was astounded. So that accompanies the Holy Spirit's work is there shall, there'll be signs and deeds. Now we talk about the apostolic age, and I've mentioned that before. That the Holy Spirit d did things different then with the apostles to affirm the fact to the people that the apostles were special and unique. Not everybody had those powers. And again, those powers, it's not about the individuals, the apostles. It's more about the Holy Spirit and what God is doing through them. Because, you know, I mean, Peter, what did Peter do? He denied Jesus three times. What did Paul do? He was killing Christians. But we see the Holy Spirit using those very same people to build the kingdom. And they, because they were giving a unique gift, just like Mary was, but it's not about them. It's about them being vessels for the Holy Spirit and God's work. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who went down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So they were still, even before that, now this is unique, and you're not going to really see it any other place for it had not yet fallen upon any of them. But obviously the Holy Spirit was working for these mighty deeds to occur. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them. Again, laying on of hands. And they received the Holy Spirit. And remember, I said this last time, in terms of the sacraments you know, or what God uses to give us grace. But the sacraments don't limit God. And so we are, he has given us those sacraments. But here you see, and I think that's why God has this in here, is to sh show us that, yeah, this is the way God's normally going to do things. But God's not limited by that. He can act any way he wants. He may impart some power to somebody who's not even a believer necessarily for his glory. So we can't limit God. But he still, he limits us in the sense of this is what we are supposed to do. Baptism, confirmation. So what do we see? So this is the early church. And so people are, you know, these huge numbers of adults who are being baptized, and they're being baptized in the Trinitarian formula, and they're being confirmed all at the same time. And it's because of the apostles, and then as the apostles die off, it's the bishops who are, to us, the apostles. Because they are 
carrying on the work of the apostles. And so that tradition continued that everybody was being baptized and confirmed through the bishop early on. Well, that worked fine early on. Um, and you can imagine, though, as the church spreads, it becomes more and more difficult in terms of being there. So they got to come to where the bishop is. But then, I mean, people have to travel long distances. And I think it was Charlie was mentioning, you know, I mean, it was a big deal, you know, <coughs> to go from town to town back then. Um, and then huge numbers start coming into the church when it becomes, Christianity becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. And so, for practical reasons, the church starts to separate out, and the, the bishop, and remember, a priest is doing what? The priest is representing the bishop. The priest's authority comes from the bishop. We are an apostolic church. My authority as a deacon comes from the bishop, not the priest, from the bishop. Because all the authority of clergy goes back to the bishop, who is the apostolic representative for us. So the bishop can delegate his authority. And he delegates it to priests to do certain things. And so he can delegate the authority to confirm. But even today, you know, we try to confirm people, especially children, are confirmed through the bishop, usually. That's the usual way. And in the original way, everybody was confirmed by the bishop. Now you're going to see at Easter, the bishop can't be at every church. And so he will delegate that authority to the priest. But in that is there's one thing the priest will use that symbolizes, and, and it must be part of the, the rite, and that's the sacred chrism, the oil. And the bishop... At the, uh, in the Last Supper in uh, Savannah, will bless the oil. That, that oil is then goes out to the different parishes and churches. So again, it ties us to the authority of the bishop and our apostolic nature. And so that's the oil. And that is the oil that must be used in baptism and in confirmation. Okay, so that's, so you see that even though the bishop is delegating the authority, in a sense, the bishop is part of that. Not only in terms of that human representative, the priest or deacon, depending on what's going on, and deacons don't usually, they're not involved in the confirmation, but in terms of baptism, um, the bishop is part of that through the sacred chrism and oil. Did you have a question? Chrism, yes. Right. What we were referring to, but I, I was wondering, is it safe to say that at some point all the apostles were in terms bishops? Because Peter is the bishop of Rome. Oh, yeah. The bishop of oh, yes. Antioch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, now, the truth is, in, in, at some point I'm going to be doing a teaching on this in, in uh, C&C, which you're all welcome to come to, on Sunday on the Church Fathers. Um, and on the, the apostles. And uh, you'll see that some of the apostles we know quite a bit about. Some of the apostles we don't know a whole lot after Pentecost. We just don't have a lot of records. Um, but they were still apostles. <laughs> okay. So you see these changes occurring in, in responding to need, and yet... Um, the bishop being part of that process at all times. And so the priests would baptize um, 
because of necessity in terms of traveling and distance as the church got bigger and bigger and the bishop couldn't be everywhere. But then the bishop would reserve the right to confirm people later. So you see this separation of the two rites and, and it becoming more clearly a sacrament. In the Eastern Rite, it's remain combined. Um, so that the theology is basically the same because it's God, it's God's grace, it's God's work, it's apostolic. It's just the uh, practice is a little different. Um, now, so this goes on and, and people see confirmation, trying to distinguish it from baptism, which you get the Holy Spirit and you get the gifts, uh, everybody who's baptized, um, that confirmation, because it occurs in a more adult age, um, that it, you know, get, empowers you more, um, gives you strength for your faith um, in terms of maturity, and gives you strength to deal with what? What was common in the early church? Persecution, right? That you didn't lose your faith. Um, and, you know, and some people did. Now, we don't know if they really did. But you can imagine some people being uh, faced with being thrown in with the lions <laughs> might say, oh, okay, uh, you know, I'm not really a Christian. But inside, they haven't said that. And that was a very big struggle for the church in terms of, okay, what do we do with those folks? Because it's very clear that people converted to the church because of that witness of martyrdom. These folks are willing to die for this faith in this guy, Jesus. There must be something to this. How many people turned away from the, that possibility when somebody said, oh, okay, I'm renouncing my faith because I might be martyred? You know, and so that's why the church struggled with that. Um, but at the same time, you know, the church is not going to judge today in terms of those people. Because faced with those kind of decisions, um, you know, hopefully we have the grace to do that and make the right choice in terms of saying, yes, I believe in Jesus no matter what. Because that's that scary scripture that says, you know, if you deny me, then I'm going to deny you before the Father. <laughs> Jesus said that. So um, in any given case, we don't know. Um, People were also, there, in terms of confirmation, it was talked about as making one, and my wife was sharing this because she's a, a cradle Catholic, in terms of emphasizing that now you're a soldier for Christ, to go out there and, and be a warrior in terms of transforming culture and society. Um, some of the, those who are cradle Catholics and were confirmed in the church, what was your experience in terms of anybody... Uh, Right. Not to mention we had to memorize all of these. <laughs> 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 we did. It was scary if the bishop asked you, you know, for one of those pages, yeah. pages, page, what pages? Yeah, I was, I'm old. I was 56, and so in my generation, we did it in 5th grade. We didn't learn that much like the all of the with the 8th grade train and two years of, so we were 5th graders. So you remember the nuns, was it about the white dress or the bowl, the money from the che checks in the envelope was about the music. And so you, so you see some variations, too, that went on from diocese to diocese, you know, that the bishop had that discretion. As being, a, as being a cradle Catholic, when you were an infant, you had no choice to become a Christian. You were baptized in Catholic faith. And confirmation, I always looked at it was, is, uh, is the time where you're much more mature in your age and you actually could make a decision that this is truly what you wanted to do. You don't have to be confirmed right. 
it's, it's uh, you know, but that, if that's a faith you like to go on with. And that's, yeah, it, 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 I wish I could accept what you said about being more mature because <laughs> I, I, I've seen some of these kids, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, that was the idea. And, and but part of the problem has become and is, you know, as parents, we have a responsibility. We should not uh, assume that kids should go forward. I think there was that mindset is, oh, kids that age and they should go forward. No, this should be more of a mature choice to go forward. Now, the difficulty that's in tension with the fact of. To go forward means additional grace. So do you push your kids ahead and try to get them to go through with the hope that they're going to get additional grace in faith? Again, those are not easy answers in terms of to that. Uh, interesting Ellen's story about learning prayers. Now, I was faced with it at, when I was in seventh grade. Or in eighth grade, I don't remember when exactly when it began. But it was World War II, and Bishop Sheehan was a bishop when I lived in New York. We get to Cleveland, different set of rules. But now I was given some papers by a mother superior, and it said that we're supposed to promise we're not going to have sex, we're not going to do this. It's a whole list of admonitions that we can't do. So I said, I want to have a conference, you know, because we had some news going on that Detroit, the convent did some bad things and the babies were found in the plumbing and all this stuff. And, uh, it was really, everybody, a lot of alcohol going on in Cleveland Heights at that time and we weren't supposed to abuse all these things. And I, I said, I said, how can I promise you all these things? I don't know, I don't know if I can do that or not. So I was a little older than we're talking about when you're in fifth grade trying to think about this stuff. Yeah. Which is the more typical, I think, these days is uh, eighth and ninth grade. So you really have to think, right? I think one, one advantage we had, too, was the fact that we had nuns and priests, you know, uh, teaching us. And they, they were real spiritual guides. Uh, we had the Franciscans and the Notre Dame nuns. And they really took us serious and really led us to a point of faith, you know. And in walking with them and hearing that constantly, besides our own parents, yeah. uh, particularly mine, my mother, uh, there, was a, there was a strong realization and empowering at that time, you know, that, uh, that this was real and this was strong. And, and our faith in, increased. I talked to my brothers and sisters about it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and watching them through, through life. Um, they were definitely empowered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and one of the differences, too, for a lot of the older folks is they went to Catholic school. So they were in a Catholic culture. And most, many of our kids today are not. It was also a great tool for parents who were very Catholic. Or Catholic. It was a great tool. Uh, religion and the faith was is a great tool for them to help bring their kids up and and uh, and enable teachers in a relatively and relatively calm thing protected environment yeah re reference back to catechism questions and all that, that you and so and so we see some folks here who who've left and come back you know <laughs> so is that the Holy Spirit because they got confirmed you know only God knows how all that plays out. In faith, we know and believe that in confirmation that you do get additional grace. Um, and part of that, come, you know, what comes with that is that it, it, because you're becoming a more adult and mature Christian, is that you should be taking that, after confirmation, more and more out to transform society and the culture. That you're empowered now to do that. But you still have to choose and make choices. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in the East, as I said, it becomes, you get this development of the double and in the, uh, I mean in the West, and in the East you get this continuation of basically baptism and confirmation occurring. In fact, giving infants um, baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. 
all at the same time. That's just a difference. Now the Protestants, you know, as we talked about, you know, tended to do away with most of the sacraments, including this. You know, like we said, now Luther accepted baptism as a sacrament, um, but not confirmation. But it continued it as a rite. They felt it was important for people to go through that uh, a ceremony anyway. Um, you know, Swingley, he, he, he basically was a dualist in that, you know, the, in terms of spiritual and the physical matters were separate. Um, you know, Calvin thought it was a good thing to do those kinds of rites, but they weren't considered sacraments. Um, the Book of Common Prayer, which is, you know, well, that's the Episcopal Church, or Anglican, really, I should say. Anglican is more proper. Uh, emphasize the public nature of baptism and catechesis on the part of godparents um, and the laying of, on of hands. Uh, Methodists, anybody here Methodist? Will you confirm? In, <coughs> and it's, uh, let's see, I, I've never seen that, experience it, but, huh? It's outlined in the Book of Discipline, which is similar to the Book of Covenant. It's like a renewal of baptismal covenant. Okay. All right. So we see in terms of the signs that go along with the, the rite is we have anointing of oil, which also represents a spirit, a seal, a mark on your soul. And oil also represents, you know, abundance and joy. Because it, you know, it tended to go along with people who had money, <laughs> frankly, you know, the wealthy in ancient times. Wasn't something everybody could have or afford, especially nice smelling oil. Um, and of course, you know, they didn't bathe a whole lot, so they liked to have some nice smelling oil around, you know, uh, for good reasons. Um, you know, and, and oil is associated with, you know, again, the analogy of being a soldier or an athlete, running the race, as Paul talks about in terms of limbering up the muscles. Um, you see images of that. You know, oil associated with a, a balm for healing and soothing and comfort, which are all characteristics of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit brings with it. Um, Christ himself, you know, when we talk about this seal, Christ himself said he'd been sealed with his Father's seal. Um, in Corinthians, but the one who gives us security with you in Christ and who anointed us is God. He has also put his seal upon us and given the spirit in our hearts as a first installment. Now we get the seal first with baptism, but then it's confirmed with confirmation. In Ephesians, again, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And later in Ephesians, with you, you were sealed for the day of redemption. I always you could interpret that as like, mm, I'm covered. Once uh, baptized, once confirmed, always confirmed. Uh, I'm going to give you a scripture to disabuse you of that. You know, Paul says that and hints at that several times. He's, you know, as Catholics, we don't believe once saved, always saved. Um, that you still have free will. You have the grace to always say yes. Christ promises us. He won't give us more than we can handle if we turn to him. But we still have free will. We are not robots just because we've been given the grace. Because again, you can't love if you can't choose. And God is a God of love. And so we always have the choice to love or not. But prior to Christ, we didn't have the grace to say yes. Now we do. And with confirmation, we have a greater grace than what we had in baptism. Oftentimes they mention the fruit too, that we must show the fruit of our work. Yes, I'm... I'm I'm going to mention that. <laughs> okay. So as I said, the consecration of the sacred chrism, 
occurs in the Chrism Mass on Holy Thursday. Um, Uh, is that what he does? Yeah. Our bishop? Yeah. Oh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, but it's supposed to be. <laughs> yes, Holy Thursday. Okay. And the, here's, now you're going to have the bishop during the rite will pray over you. Um, but here's the key thing that he's going to do. He's going to anoint you with oil. Well, it won't be the bishop, but... Um, Father McDonald, and be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those are the key words. That's right. And you want to say amen to that. <laughs> and when that happens, when he says those words, you will then be confirmed. Okay? Now, in Acts, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them. So they were baptized. But then later, again, the whole idea of their, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, there should never be a separation. Well, obviously there's something different that happens. They get baptized and then later Paul lays hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came upon them in a special way. So that it's very biblical to do that, and the bishop, I mean, the priest will lay hands on you. I remember when he does that, he is, in, in essence, it's the bishop doing that through Father McDonald, and that's why your name and the, why there's the right of election, because your name will go in a book. Those who are um, brought into the church at Easter. Um, and the bishop will recognize this, you know, publicly. Therefore, let us leave behind the basic teaching about Christ and advance to maturity. This is in Hebrew. Without laying the foundation all over again. Repentance from dead works and faith in God. Instruction about baptisms and laying on of hands. Resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And we shall do this if only God permits. So... Grow in maturity. That's what we need. That's why we need the grace from confirmation. To grow and mature in our faith. That even though you get grace, it's not, boom, one-shot process. In the in a sense of, okay, I'm a done product, right? <laughs> People are still sinners. So you've got the grace because of, as we mentioned before, concupiscence that we can still sin, but then how do we get that grace back? Because basically is grace starts from God, because remember, and, you know, I mentioned it up here in terms of Adam and Eve were in a state of grace, right? They were in right relationship with God, and that's what me means to be in a state of grace. You're in a right relationship with God. And Adam and Eve, they had it. And they said, eh, God, we want to do our own thing. They lost their state of grace. And so then man is trying to earn it. Just like all the other religions, in a sense. They're trying to earn it through the law. Oh, if we obey the law, we're okay. And what happens? They fail over and over and over again. Time after time. God's plan, you know, hey, here's the example. And so Jesus comes. And now we can get the grace. Now it's grace that enables us to say yes, to do it. It's a gift. It's not us. It's the grace of God. But we still have to say yes to that grace. That's why, you know, some of the extreme ideas in terms of Calvin, in terms of, they would say, because of concupiscence in the fallen nature, is human beings can't even say yes. God's throwing out the lifeline of grace. That's what I like to use. You know, you're, we're all drowning in sin. And God's throwing out the lifeline. We can pick up the lifeline or not. 
But it's God's the one who's saving us. We still have that choice. I like the scripture that goes, we co cooperate with his grace. Right. And we don't cooperate, then we feel guilty, and then we go to confession. We, right. Well, but, well, that's why when we were talking about, and, and uh, Buck brought up the whole idea in terms of justification alone doesn't work, because what does it mean to follow Jesus? We get the grace, and we have to say what? Yes, and obey, to do what he says. It requires a response, an action. We don't just go sit in our house and say, oh, I got the grace. We got to do something. We got to respond. So that's why you can't have this dualism of it's just grace and doing nothing. You got to work. You got to respond. Because what is sin? It's not doing what God has called us to do. That's what sin is. Either by commission or omission, right? We can sin by not doing what God calls us to do, or we can sin by doing something we shouldn't do. And most often that yes is in terms of faith. Right. Moving in faith. You know, I believe, therefore I do it. Right. Right. And, and as we, you know, I think was Charlie brought it up in terms of even the demons know who Jesus is. <laughs> but they don't have the grace to say, yes, I'm going to do what Jesus says. We do through baptism and confirmation. So that's why it's a continual working out in terms of our walk. is continually saying yes. And sometimes we say no. And that's why God has given us penance. He continues to want to... His love is so great that He gives us many ways in terms of giving us grace. Penance, the Eucharist especially. It's all about grace. And it's God's work, but we have to say yes to God's work. All right. So what happens? Because you've been confirmed, what should we see? We talked about, just to reiterate, the gifts that got, came with baptism. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. We got those at baptism. We're given more grace in terms of those gifts, because we all get those, as I mentioned in my homily, is everybody gets those. Now certainly some people may have more than a, one of those than another, but we should all have those gifts. And, and confirmation helps those to grow. <clears throat> but we also ought to see some fruit and evidence of that in our lives. And sometimes that's going to occur slowly. Sometimes you'll see dramatic changes in people. Um, how many of here, you know, have had a dramatic conversion experience. Okay, one, two. <clears throat> well, I, you know, I could just share mine. Is I, you know, I came to a point in my life, and this was before I became Catholic, where I was searching what's truth, and I looked at all the different faiths, and basically came to a point in my life, a fork, it was either be hedonist, because, hey, might as well just live for the now, you know, and enjoy life. Or Jesus was real. Well, obviously I didn't pick hedonism. But it was like, bingo. Like, there was a change for me. I mean, like, my language changed. You didn't hear any swear words or cuss words coming out of my mouth. Just bingo, just like that. Um, and... Um, just very clear that I needed to go do certain things. You know, I didn't hear God speaking to me, but it was just clear that there were two things I needed to do. And, and you know, in terms of move back near family and find strong Christians to be with. It was just those two things. By the way, I interviewed at Oral Roberts, and <laughs> turned out that wasn't where I was supposed to be. So... Um, God worked it all out. So anyway, that was kind of, it wasn't dramatic in terms of all these signs coming down, but there were, and those were small things, you know. Nobody else would have necessarily noticed, but I noticed. For me, it was a real confirmation 
that something different had happened for me. Anybody else want to share? Sure. Um, I was raised Catholic. Raised Catholic and uh, nothing seemed to be going right. And I thought I was a good guy. You know, I wasn't. I didn't do everything I was supposed to do, but I thought I was a good guy. And uh, something went really bad at work, and I got trouble for it. I remember that night. It was why. Why God? Why? Why? Why is this happening? You know, I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good guy. All this stuff. Why? Why are you doing all these things to me? Every time that I try to go to point A, you keep putting my car in a ditch. Was my analogy. And it was the crystal, probably the most clear thought I've ever had in my life. And it was, well, you're going the wrong way. Then the next, I'm like, all right, well, I don't know where to go. Then the next most crystal clear thought. Was, well, fine, let me drive. Just follow me. And it was liberating. It was one of those, you know, it's just me in a hotel room. I mean, you know, there's no voices or anything, but just two crystal clear thoughts. <coughs> liberating. It's like, all right, well, wherever you want to take me, take me. And then it just takes some discipline to listen. It was, it was different. The world was different. Up there. And so, you know, sometimes you may have something dramatic, but sometimes it's going to be subtle. And I could tell you, I had these kind of dramatic things in terms of we moved to Augusta, joined a Christian community. And I have to tell you, for the next 20 years, I struggled with my Christian walk. <laughs> so it was dramatic, and then it was painful for a long time, you know. <laughs> um, because I was in with a group, and they were having all these things and experiences, and, and I wasn't having any of that anymore, you know. It just went... Um, but I, but, you know, my faith was confirmed and I knew who Jesus was, you know, so I wasn't going to leave him, but man, it was tough. I can tell you. Yeah, conversion within your conversion. You know that because that's important for people in the room. I think that was a conversion within the conversion. We came alive. Right. Because you began to study. Yeah. Well, I've, I've shared that, you know, I mean, the, you know, the, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me in terms of led me in a different direction, being, being part of this Christian community, but the Holy Spirit led me in terms of studying church documents. Because I, to be honest, I was not a very good Catholic. I was a pretty good Christian, but I wasn't a really good Catholic in terms of knowing my faith and whatnot. Because I was part of this charismatic community that was ecumenical, and, and I had joined them, and then I became Catholic, and so I was relying on them for a lot, and then I started studying the church like you all are, and it's like, I mean, it was just, my eyes were opened, you know, and like, it was very dramatic for me. But that was 20 years later. <laughs> no, it wasn't that long, but it was like 10 years later, so, struggling. Don't you think the Lord really confirms us many times during our lives? In other words, if, if we begin, it, it's like a revival, you know? Uh, obedience is, is one good word for revival. Yeah. And, and when, and when we're called, uh, and if we're in prayer, and if we're in scripture, a lot of times he calls us and says, okay, I want you to do this now. Can you see where I'm coming from? And he shows you, you know. And we make up our mind then to do something different. It seems like I've had many of those throughout my life. And the more that I focus on prayer and scripture and in his work, the more he convicts me. Yeah. But, but I, I want to caution you in terms of everybody's walk is unique. And if you read Mother Teresa, you're going to see. Because she struggled 50 years in terms of am I really doing what the Lord wants? And yet, I mean, she is getting all kinds of affirmation in terms of what she's doing. But internally, she's struggling. And so... But you can see the fruit in her life, right? That's the difference. She had a hard time seeing the fruit in her own life. But everybody else saw it. And so sometimes you do need to turn to other people in terms of getting that affirmation. So everybody's... And you know what? Remember what I said last time. I said, you know, you should see with confirmation there should be change. Could be slow, may dr be dramatic. But remember what comes with it, the cross. 
I don't want to ever kid people in terms of the cross comes with it. You may go through periods of time and, and early on in terms of just everything's hunky-dory. I promise you, you will come to the cross at some point. That's part of the walk. When? Will it be early? Will it be late? Yeah. The best scripture you can think about as convert is the fact that Jesus came to the off. Then he said, he said, your sins are forgiven. Then he said, it is why you have to forgive sin. The greater conversion was forgiveness of sins than the healing. But God will do miracles sometimes in your life to drop right. yourself. But the greater conversion is when you can forgive sin. That's, that's what Jesus came to do, right? To right. Right. Now, so the fruit, the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All right? And, and the thing that can be remarkable is if you turn to the Lord is in, during those crosses is you can still sense the Lord is there and, and a certain sense of peace. All right? No. What uh, crosses? Are we talking about this crosses to bear? Is that a yeah. Yeah, sure. That we bear crosses. We can bear crosses for a long period of time. We can have a cross that can come and last for a short period of time. That's part, that's part of the walk, you know, and everybody's different in terms of what you, to a certain degree, you've had a cross, right? What, what I've got other crosses. I'm, but I'm just, I'm wondering if that's what you're talking about, the, the things we put, the, suffering. you're calling the cross. The cross is suffering. Suffering. Yeah. Like right. Because the point is, is you know, as Terry is hitting at in terms of faith, is that, you know, if everything's hunky dory, that doesn't take any faith. What kind of faith is that? If if you go through life and everything's just going clicking and going the way you want, that doesn't require faith. Even the pagans can believe in that. You can't appreciate the good times without looking at the bad. Things. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Jesus tells us that he loves us, or maybe this is Paul writing, that uh, he's going to test us because he loves us. He's he, going to prune and we're going to grow. Yes, Paul, Paul talks about that and Jesus does too to some degree, that it will happen. But, but I don't want to ever say that God gave us bad things, okay? The, the truth is bad things will come our way <laughs> because of life. And, you know, and, and th now this is partly my opinion, but, you know, because pe you will hear people say, well, God allowed that in that specific circumstance. Well, I don't know that God allowed it in that specific circumstance. Everything that happens, God allowed. So be careful with that when you say, oh, well, God allowed that. Well, he allowed this over here and that and that and everything else that's happening. Because we, we assume that God, we're saying, oh, God specifically allowed that to happen in your life. Well, maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of bad things going on that happen in terms of what we call natural law. You know, somebody decides to pull out a gun and shoot people. Right? I don't believe God got in there and said, okay, I'm going to allow this guy to do that. He allows us again free will. Too. Yes, he gives us the grace to do that, to resist that. But what he does say, he promises us, he won't give us more than we can handle. And two, is if we turn to him, he'll work it out for the good. Because what did the cross do for us? It gave us justification so that we could have the grace. So the grace can now flow again. It's because of the cross. Sorry. <laughs> There's so much original sin in the world that if we were born, uh, you could say that he allowed all these things. Well, that's the part of free will, you know? Right. So, I mean, he's going to allow original sin to work its work. Right, its work. right, right. But he is there to help, like you said. Exactly, exactly. All right, so those are the fruits, and then we have gifts, as I mentioned in the hotline, in terms of he gives us gifts for the body of Christ. They're not for you. The gifts for the body of the Christ are to build up the body of Christ and to bring forth the kingdom here on earth. Recognizing, remember, that there will never be a utopia 
until the second coming. Think there will always be difficulties. And when somebody gets up, you know, because we see this in Revelation, and, and Jesus talks about this some in, Paul, in terms of somebody gets up and comes like, oh, I'm going to solve all the ills. It ain't going to happen. We know that. God said it. The church says it. We work towards, as now that we've been confirmed, we work towards improving the world. To bring in Christ to the world. But we know, until the second coming, that it's not going to be perfected. And we won't be perfected, probably. You know, the saints get close, some of them, but even they are not perfect. Only Mary was, right? All right, so we have all these gifts in terms of healing and discernment of spirits and varieties of tongues. And Paul mentions all this, and then he goes on and he says some more. He says, apostles, prophets, teachers, mighty deeds, healing, assistance. You know, don't get locked into that in terms of saying, okay, here's the list, and if I don't have one of these, then I don't have a gift. Well, not necessarily. I mean, Paul isn't necessarily being exhausted. And saying these are the only gifts that God and the Holy Spirit, well, let's not limit God, okay? But we have gifts, and so every one of us has spiritual gifts. And with confirmation, we need to discern what is it that God wants me to do. What are my gifts, and how does he want me to use them? That's our duty and responsibility. As all Christians are called to that, and that's what confirmation should enable you to do. Again, sometimes it happens slowly. It's like pulling teeth. Sometimes it happens quickly. And you'll know. But don't be discouraged. You know, get help. Um, let's see. So, I think I've pretty well covered most of these. But I wanted to read why this is important in free will. In Hebrews 6.1, Therefore, let us leave behind the basic teaching about... Oh, I already mentioned that part, but I want to go on. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit. Obviously, these are believers, right? Sounds like it to me. Sounds like that's what he's describing. And tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. To bring them to repentance again, since they are re-crucifying the Son of God for themselves and holding Him up to contempt. Ooh, that's a pretty scary scripture, if you ask me. But of course, you know, to a certain degree, whenever we sin, we're doing that. And one of the things when you, you know, go to communion or you, one of the things to think about, um, and of course you can deal with this in terms of the sacrament of penance, but to, to start thinking about, you know what? Um, I'm the one who put Jesus on that cross. I'm the one who scourged Jesus. Not other people. Me. I did it. Because I sinned. Take it personal. Okay. Any questions? And then we'll break up. We've got plenty of time to break up into our groups. In regard to like, having a conversion experience, and, and people do have them, obviously, but don't you have to be a little careful? I mean, there are like, constant denominations that if you don't have a conversion experience, you're not a real believer. Yeah, that, yeah and that's baloney. And I think Father McDonald said in one of his talks with us that the church isn't always about emotions or emotional. Absolutely. You have to believe in what there is to believe, whether you feel an emotion or not, and that's what makes the church solid Faith. for you. Right. Faith. Yes. So if you, if you and when I say dramatic, it was like inside I knew something was different, but it wasn't like, you know, lights and bells and whistles or, or an emotional thing. Although the, the, the one thing I say is there was this sense of like load that was gone. Mm -hmm. And you hear people say that. You know, uh, you know, for a lot of people, that, that's an experience but, that they have. But, but go ahead. I want people to think that because they don't have an experience like that, exactly. they can be a believer. And that's why I said, too, is 
it may come slow. It may not be dramatic. Um, but don't be afraid of the experience. But at the same time, don't use that as the criteria. Exactly. Um, everybody's walk is unique. But the, it's the fruits. There ought to be a difference in terms of where you're headed and what you're doing. There should be some evidence of that. You should feel this, certainly this sense of belonging to the church.